Okay, hello everybody. Um, so this will be um, the first lecture, I guess, or audio um, on Moodle. So ho um, hopefully we'll be able to follow along um, and we'll kind of get through these next few weeks kind of in this format. Um, like I've said in the classroom, just please contact me with any questions. I'll be checking my email every couple of days. Um, or you have my cell phone available, um, please feel free to call or text if you need to talk to me um, immediately or um, within you know a few hours or whatever. But please keep in contact and we'll be able to work through these next few weeks. Um, and you guys can continue to learn and I can take care of what I need to at home. So um, anyways, let's get started. Um, we've started our nutrition section and this is going to be the lecture on the proximate analysis and energy evaluation of feeds. Okay, this is the second half of chapter 15 in your textbook. So you might want to have your textbook out kind of as we go through here, um, but we'll go ahead and kind of work through the PowerPoint. Okay, so proximate analysis, what does that mean? Um, the definition of proximate analysis um, is when it separates feed components into groups according to their feeding value. Okay, so it's taking um, feedstuffs and it is um, kind of separating them and evaluating um, their feeding value, okay, for animals. And it's based on a feed sample, okay, but how representative of the feed source is the sample, okay? Um, if you go out, if you're baling alfalfa hay or something, and you find the greenest, most lush bale, and that's where you pull your sample from, that's probably not very representative, okay? Um, or if you have a bag of feed or something um, and you pull out the very top or something that maybe it's separated from, that's not going to be very representative. Okay, so make sure if you're ever involved in this or taking hay samples or something like that, make sure you try and get something that's as representative of the entire source as possible. Okay, typically um, these are going to be reported on a dry matter basis. So in this blank section it's going to be referred to as dry matter basis, okay, and we'll get it more into that in just a little bit, okay. It's also going to show the organic and the inorganic components of feed, okay. Now if you remember back to your basic biology, organic means that it contains carbon, inorganic means that it does not contain carbon, okay, so that's kind of that, that definition of organic versus inorganic, okay. Um, however, it does not distinguish the various components of a nutrient, okay. So it won't break down um, specifically into, you know, of the vitamin and mineral component, how much is calcium, how much is vitamin D, um, stuff like that, unless you ask them to go a step farther, unless you ask the feed lab, okay? Um, so the way that they do that is they'll do it by a chemical analysis, okay? And without getting too biochemical based, okay? Um, in figure 15.3 or page 243 of your text, um, it essentially puts this little chart into a visual for you. Okay, so make sure and pull up that chart or that figure um, in your text right now. Maybe pause the video and pull that up and take a look at it. Okay, it breaks down the six key nutrients that we've already talked about. Okay, and what what they are. Okay, it takes the organic components of the nitrogenous into protein down to amino acids, okay? The fats and lipids down to the simple compound or the pseudo, down into the most basic, which are the fatty acids and the fat soluble vitamins. Then it takes the carbohydrates and goes down into the crude fiber or those mono, di, and polysaccharides, all the way down to the basic carbohydrates of sugar, starches, cellulose, and water soluble vitamins, okay? Then the inorganic factor is the macro and the micro minerals, all of these guys here. Okay, so again, reference that figure in your text and that will help break that down. Okay, so continuing on, digestibility. Okay, digestibility as it relates to nutrition, animal nutrition, is the amount of various nutrients in a feed that are absorbed in the digestive tract. Okay, so digestibility is referring to not only how much nutrients are in the feed, but what's actually going to be absorbed in the digestive tract of that animal, okay? It might be loaded with, you know, all sorts of nutrients and this and that, um, like, a, like a branch from a tree is loaded with a ton of energy, which is why it burns and, and um, makes heat when it burns. 
but it's not a digestible product because it doesn't matter how many sticks your cows are going to eat they're not going to it's not digestible and your cows can't pull that energy out of those sticks okay so remember that's the that's the difference between digestibility and basically a nutrition component okay um, a lot of times they'll run what are called digestion trials um, and at bigger universities they do this all the time um, kind of looking at how much um, of a feed stuff is actually digestible by that animal or how much that animal can pull out of it. The difference between the nutrients fed and the nutrients excreted is the apparent digestibility. Okay. Um, one of the most basic um, ones that they do or kind of the, one of the more straightforward ones is the nitrogen component in feed. So they'll look at the amount of the nitrogen in the feed, they'll collect fecal samples, um, and analyze that for the amount of nitrogen in the feces, and that is a di direct correlation of percent digestibility. Okay, so that's just one quick um, example of, you know, how they'll take the feed and how much nutrition is in that, and then they'll take a fecal sample and evaluate how much nitrogen is in the feces to be able to determine um, how much the animal took out. Okay. So energy evaluation of feeds, okay, um, energy, remember, is the capacity to do work, okay, any kind of work, that's a physics um, definition, but energy is the capacity to do work, okay, and it's the amount of heat produced when a nutri nutrient is completely oxidized during digestion, okay, carbohydrates, fats, and proteins can all be used to provide energy, okay, so those are those blanks, carbs, fats, and protein. Total digestible nutrients, TDN, okay, is after approximate analysis and digestibility figures of the feed, okay? So TDN is going to refer to, and this is talking about an entire feed sample, okay, is going to be the digestible crude protein, digestible crude fiber, which again is that carbohydrate component, okay? Digestible nitrogen-free extract is going to be part of the fat or the lipid component, and then also digestible crude fat, okay? And the digestible crude fat is times 2.25, okay? And we'll come back to that in just a second, okay? So TDN is going to be digestible crude protein, digestible crude fiber, digestible nitrogen-free extract, and digestible crude fat, okay? A few more side notes, okay, we've talked about that digestible energy and then that TDN. They're very comparable, just use different units, okay, and if you look at feed samples and feed analysis, sometimes these are interchangeable or you'll get one or the other on your results, okay. Now I said that we'd come back to this 2.25, okay, fat provides 2.25 times the energy of carbs and proteins, okay. Across the board, whether it's a bag of chips that we eat or a, you know, a scoop of corn for your cows, okay, nutrients in feeds and food, okay, carbohydrates provide four calories per gram, protein provides four calories per gram, and fats is nine calories per gram, okay, four times 2.25 is equal to nine, okay, so that's why on this last slide it's the fat component times 2.25, okay? It's because fat provides two and a quarter times more energy than do carbs and protein, okay? This is very important. This will come back on your quiz, okay? So the, I want you to remember that carbs provide four, protein four, and fats nine. Okay, this is a figure from your book, okay? And it's kind of a visual, okay? So we look at our feed intake and that feed is providing a gross energy amount, okay? I talked about how there were some fecal samples taken, okay? So the first step that they'll take in proximate analysis is when they're gonna take the gross energy, and they're gonna try to look at how much of that gross energy was digestible energy, okay? And that will be the energy lost in feces, okay? So this will decrease because there's energy lost in those feces. The next step is digestible down to met metabolizable, Okay, and that's energy lost in the urine and gases. Okay, and then the last one is going to be metabolizable energy down to net energy. Okay, and that's going to be the energy lost in form of heat. Okay, 
or producing body heat for the animal, okay? So then you're left with this net energy, okay? And this is where it gets really important and kind of the takeaway from this chart. This chart is very important, so put a star next to this chart in your PowerPoint because I want you to understand kind of where you have feed intake all the way down to what the animal is doing, okay? So that last component is the net energy, and it's divided into two separate spots, okay? It's net energy for maintenance of the animal, okay? So basic bodily functions, the digestion process, um, respiration, um, you know, keeping the heart pumping, all that kind of stuff, okay? Basic maintenance of the animal, okay? Over here to this production, okay? So anything that's left after maintenance can be shuttled over to production, and that's when you can produce a calf, lay an egg for a laying hen, um, produce more meat on a fat steer, stuff like that, okay? I feel like this chart could be improved by taking this line out, so if you were to erase this line, and instead put an arrow down here, okay? Because first, for net energy, you have to meet your maintenance requirement first. And then after that maintenance requirement is met, that's when the additional or the extra energy can be shuttled over to production, okay? Obviously, an animal is not going to be producing a fetus or milk or an egg before their own body maintenance, okay? So just remember that net energy is broken down into both maintenance and production, okay? But the maintenance has to be met first. So put a number one over here and put a number two over here, okay? Okay, so net energy, talking more about that net energy system there at the bottom, okay? Um, there's two different types of ration balancing, and if you have any interest in nutrition, um, this is kind of your wheelhouse, okay? Um, or if you have a nutritionist that works with your ranch or um, dairy or something like that, typically they're going to be using a professional nutritionist. Okay, and the old way of ration balancing or figuring out what to feed your animals is the TDN, okay, ration balancing. That's being replaced by net energy, okay. It's more precise and it's more in line with the animal's state of production and growth, okay. Um, so a few more definitions, okay, calorie, kilocalorie, and megacalorie, okay. A calorie is what we're probably the most familiar with, okay. And the definition of calorie is it's the energy required to raise the temperature of one gram of water one degree Celsius. Okay? Um, so again, I'll say that one more time. It's the energy required to raise the temperature of one gram of water one degree Celsius. Okay? Then these other two are just kind of um, larger units of that basic calorie. A kilocalorie is one kilogram of water one degree Celsius, okay, and a megacalorie is 1,000 kilocalories or 1 million calories, okay. The main one that I want you to know is this, this calorie, okay, it's the energy required to raise one gram of water one degree Celsius, okay. So again, we talked about that net energy system, okay, net energy the number one is going to be net energy for maintenance, okay? That's going to be that basal metabolism, just your basic bodily functions, voluntary activity, and body temperature regulation, okay? All those basic things that you don't even think about, okay? But that those are the basis of living, okay? Number two is going to be that production. So remember, we have that net energy system. Number one has to be met first, maintenance, and number two is second, production. And production, again, can be anything from fetal development, semen production, growth, fat and protein, um, and production of eggs, milk, and wool, okay? But again, this really important factor of number two is only sustained if stored or provided energy is in excess of number one, okay? So we'll pause there and we'll pick up with the next lecture.